Kyiv is back in Ukrainian hands, and as Ukrainians themselves move back to the capital city, Western allies are returning as well. A number of those allies are reestablishing their embassies. The feds here say that's the plan eventually, but so far, no details. The CBC's David Common is in Kyiv with reaction. Hi, David. Good to have you back. As always, countries like the U.S. are certainly starting the process of reopening embassies in Kyiv. Some of our allies have actually already done so. Canada has yet to confirm any kind of timeline for this country to follow suit. How is that playing out in Ukraine? Well, it is being noticed. You know, in the words of the uh, former Ukrainian ambassador to Canada, he says Canada was one of the first countries to close its embassy, and he doesn't want it to be the last to reopen it. Just looking at the course of today, a Denmark reopened its embassy. That, I think, makes 28 nations who've either reopened their missions, their diplomatic missions uh, in this capital city, uh, or um, there are a number of nations that, in fact, never closed them. Uh, the United States uh, has some particular security sensitivity they're suggesting that they may not return to Kiev in a sort of more of full-time manner until closer to the end of this month. The Canadian embassy, really just down the road from where I'm speaking to you right now, and the sign out front still says not only that it's closed, but that you need to go to Lviv, a city closer to the Polish border, if you need services from a Canadian diplomatic mission. Of course, there are no Canadian diplomats. That sign suggests to us how long it has been posted there. It's gathering dust. Um, and uh, when we ask um, uh, Global Affairs Canada, they say to us there is a plan, but there are particular security sensitivities, uh, and they are concerned about the well-being of their staff, only to note that there are a number of other nations, more than two dozen, that have made the decision to reopen their embassies in this city. And, and what about, David, even uh, traveling to Ukraine? I think the last time we spoke, you were uh, it was just on the heels of, for example, Secretary of State Blinken's uh, visit to Ukraine. Are, are there any? Is there anything in the works, basically, for Canadian officials to do so? Well, uh, not that we know of, and we've asked that question directly of the Prime Minister's office. And certainly, when heads of state, heads of government have come to this country, it has typically been under sec significant security um, and, and secrecy that they tend to show up. Uh, that there are a limited number of people who know that they then leave and only when they're out of the country uh, do, does the world find out that they have in fact been here. But there have been a lot who have come here, you know, somewhere in the area of 11 prime ministers, some presidents as well. We ran into the prime minister of Bulgaria who was out touring the damage north of the city um, where half of the buildings have been raised in one particular suburb. And he said, you have to basically see it to believe it. You have to be here. You can't, in his words, be just in the comfort of your office uh, that you need to be here as a show of support. We've seen the UN Secretary General come here, the head of the European Commission as well. When things were really still smoldering and smoking, uh, she came that early after the Russian withdrawal from the north and, and from the direct threat to this capital city, Kyiv. There have been a significant number of players that have come to this city Canada not yet, anyway, sending even a cabinet minister. And that, too, being noticed here. Just by way of some of the logistics, this is not a secret, what I'm about to tell you, but those who have arrived, you talk about the U.S. Secretaries of State and Defense, they arrive by special train that brings them in from, let's say, the border area around Poland, uh, into this city, and then they are taken out by the same route. Because, of course, air travel in this country not happening in terms of civil aviation. High risk of getting shot into the sky, in fact, if you're an aircraft over this country right now. Okay, thanks, David. Appreciate the information, as always. That's the CBC's David Common in Kyiv. For more on that and the state of Russia's war on Ukraine, let's bring in retired General David Petraeus. He's the former director of the CEI and is in Arlington, Virginia. Hi, General Petraeus. Good to meet you. Be with you, Rashi. I appreciate you making the time. I have a number of questions for you on the latest uh, developments where Russia's war on Ukraine is concerned. But, but I did want to start off, if, if I could, on a little bit of a conversation that's taking place domestically here in this country, and that's around reestablishing a diplomatic presence in Ukraine. I know that, for example, the U.S. has said uh, sending diplomats back to western Ukraine and eventually going to reopen in Kyiv. A number of our allies have reopened their embassies in Kyiv. Uh, Canada has yet to do so or establish a firm timeline for doing so. From, from your vantage point, how important is it for western countries to go back to Ukraine in some capacity? 
Well, I think it depends on the country, frankly, and how significant the relationship uh, was before the removal of the diplomatic representation, uh, and therefore how important it is to return it to Ukraine soil, uh, ultimately to Ukraine's capital. In Ukraine's capital, for and this is not specific to Canada, but but you know, more widely for, for countries going back there or sending diplomats back there, is there a special significance in uh, having some kind of presence in Kyiv, just given what happened through the trajectory of the war with that capital city? Well, obviously, there's real value in having a physical connection with the Ukrainian government. Uh, we've seen that with all of the different delegations that have gone to Kyiv. Most recently, of course, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, who was there over the weekend, uh, I, th I think that's invaluable. Um, and so in that sense, yes, there is uh, considerable value, but of course there's also considerable risk. And uh, those at the top of government have to uh, understand those risks. They have to try to mitigate them to the extent that they can, uh, but they're going to incur risk by returning individuals to a city that is still occasionally struck by missiles, rockets, and bombs. Uh, as far as the uh, the Russian strategy or, or, or what's happening right now, General, this morning a British intelligence report is saying Russia's elite forces have suffered such big casualties that it will take years to replenish them. The intelligence shows, according to the UK, more than 25 percent, in fact, of Russia's invading force has been disabled since the start of the conflict. Do those numbers may, uh, kind of mesh with your impression so far? They do. Um, and if you put those together with what we've gotten from a whole variety of sources, and I should note that this is the first war in which there's been this incredible amount of real-time uh, video and data coming in. Uh, what you have is everyone who has a cell phone is a reporter these days, a smartphone. They can be uploaded to a variety of social media platforms. And then there are actually aggregators that exist to pull all this together and make sense out of it. I subscribe to one of those, as do many people. Uh, and then there are just aggregators that are on Twitter uh, that you can follow their threads and find out. You actually can have a feel for what's going on on the front lines because that information is coming from the front lines uh, and being put together and made sense of. So uh, again, I think a lot of people around the world are surprised at how granular the understanding is of what's going on. Uh, certainly the UK intelligence has been a contributor to that, but there are a number of others uh, as well in this particular case. And certainly the damage that has been done uh, to Russian forces has been extraordinary. Uh, they've sustained well over double the number of casualties that they took in nine or so years of war in Afghanistan, a very tough war for them. Uh, gosh, I think they must be up to four or five times the number of casualties that we took uh, in Iraq. And obviously, we had very tough periods there during the surge, uh, in particular, when I was privileged to be the commander. At the same time, uh, General, we are seeing Ukraine announce the closure of its four main seaports after losing control of them to Russian forces or having them blockaded. Uh, we are aware a few weeks ago, Russia essentially de redeployed uh, to the south and the east. Are you seeing that strategy be successful for them? What, 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 what is your, I guess, assessment of where things stand there? Well, of course, they failed in their main effort at the beginning because, in fact, it was one of only many uh, efforts. So the main effort initially, of course, was to take Kyiv, topple the government, and replace President Zelensky with a pro-Russian figure. Uh, and then presumably he would get the rest of Ukraine under control and the troops could go home to a victory parade. Uh, that obviously didn't transpire. The Ukrainians prevented the Russians from even getting beyond the outskirts of Kyiv, ultimately were counterattacking uh, against them to the north and to the east, and the Russians withdrew their forces from that particular effort and also from that around two other major cities uh, in northern Ukraine. Um, so you had the Ukrainians win the battles of Kyiv and also of Chernihiv and Sumy. Then they concentrated their forces in the east, but in many respects um, sent forces there that were not really reconstituted in the way that a military organization would like to do that. In other words, to replace the personnel losses and the equipment losses and give them some time to work together, to train and, and so forth. Uh, they just shoved these units into combat into the east somewhat piecemeal 
And once again, they really haven't concentrated their forces in a particular main effort. They have a number of different uh, efforts in the east and the southeast, and from, from then also from Mariupol, uh, the major port on the Sea of Azov in the southeast, which they have indeed taken control of, with the exception of a very substantial uh, steel production complex in which the final defenders have been hold, holding out for a number of weeks now. Um, they have had incremental gains, but they've been very hard fought and have been very costly. Uh, so uh, again, I wouldn't say that this is a successful uh, strategy at this point in time. They've also been prevented from getting even halfway to the major port of Ukraine, which is Odessa, which is directly on the Black Sea in the southwest portion of the country. Although, as you rightly point out, the, the blockade of that port prevents it from being used in the way that it would normally be uh, helping the economy of Ukraine and helping the economies of the rest of the world. Because, of course, Ukrainian wheat and, and other products are critical uh, to the foodstuffs, particularly of uh, countries in North and indeed throughout Africa, North Africa in particular, and Egypt, uh, very prominent among them. Okay, General Petraeus, I'm out of time. I'll leave it there. I appreciate your time and analysis. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Thanks.